Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Lucy Calderon and I'll be moderating the event today. This webinar has been organized by the Earth Journalism Network or EJN, which is a program of the Global Development Organization Internews. The EJN has a mission to improve the quality and quantity of journalism around the environment and it does this by helping journalists around the world report on climate change, biodiversity and conservation, pollution and other issues by providing study grants, training fellowships and other kinds of support. EJN is also a community of more than 14,000 journalists in about 180 countries. If you are not a member yet and you would like to be one, please visit earthjournalism.net to register. By registering, you will be the first to hear about story grants, fellowships, and events like this webinar, which title is Telling Powerful Marine and Coastal Stories, Unpacking Complex Topics. Because as you know, environmental journalism isn't just doing copy and paste from some scientific studies or press releases. In fact, telling stories about the natural world and humanity's place in it, it is a tough job to do well. A journalist has to find the balance between relating factual information often about very complex issues in a way that an audience finds engaging. This is no less true in stories about marine and coastal issues which journalists in Central America and the Caribbean are very familiar with. From explaining the importance of Sochantela for coral reefs to shedding light on an illegal waste dumping scheme along a beach, a coastal or marine story may touch on ecology, economics, politics, culture, and more. The task may seem overwhelming, but these two journalists, Victor René Rodriguez Sanchez and Isabel Alarcón, have demonstrated how effectively this type of stories can be told with great success. That's why they, Isabel from Ecuador and Victor from Mexico, both former EJN grantees, are our invited panelists. Isabel Alarcón is a journalist with nine years of experience in environmental and social issues. From 2014 until December 2021, she worked as a journalist at Diario El Comercio, the largest newspaper in Ecuador, where she was in charge of covering all environmental issues. She currently works as a freelancer and has written for media outlet such as Utopia Ecuador, La Barra Espaciadora, Monga Bay Latam, China Dialogue in Spanish, Climate Tracker, and Inside Crime. She has received the scholarships from the International Center for Journalists, Fundación Gabo, and Global Youth Biodiversity Network. She has covered international events such as Biodiversity COP15 in Montreal, Canada. Her story about the impacts of Asian Fleet garbage on the Galapagos Island one, was one of the three finalists in the Witten Stories category of the Jorge Mantilla Ortega 2022 Awards, the most recognized journalism award in Ecuador. Environmental journalism has allowed her to bring together her passions, writing, traveling, and contributing to the protection of the planet. And her goal is to motivate others to write about environmental issues. Uh, while Victor is a Mexican journalist who has also a lot of experience covering these topics too. And he is going to share with us also his passion for environmental news. Uh, please, if you have any questions, you have to write it on the Q&A uh, feature of the Zoom, not in the chat because we, are, we, we will be moderating the Q&A feature, not the chat. So with nothing to add, I would like to open the floor for Isabel. Thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, I'm going to share my, my screen. Yeah, it's, it's okay there. Okay, 
Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Isabel Alarcón, as Lucy told you a little bit about my experience. And as she told you, I want to motivate others also to um, write about this environmental journalism. So I hope uh, to do that today with you. Um, so to start, I would like to talk uh, some general aspects like um, which are main environmental topics. So as you have heard, um, environmental issues include economy, politics, uh, security, health, society. Uh, they are intersectional, so they are everywhere. Uh, some issues that we can cover are climate crisis, biodiversity, industries, uh, land degradation, extractive activities, pollution, environmental local policies, policies and finance, and also uh, it's important to focus on solutions, real and false solutions. Uh, how can we find innovative coastal marine investigations and story topics? So here is, I'm going to share a little bit about my experience. Uh, for me, it's very, very important to have a close relationship with local communities, uh, to go and visit and to know which are their main problems, uh, because this uh, is something that does not appear in general in media and you can find uh, hundreds of thousands of problems that they are facing right now and are underreported. Um, I think it's very important to support on experts and media because we are uh, not experts. Uh, we don't study science. So uh, it's very important that uh, they help us also to read papers and to, to give us data. Uh, also social media, for me, it's important social media because it can be a starting point. Uh, now, many alerts are given on social media, so we can start from there and then uh, do our journalistic job like uh, contrast and, and ask to, to specialize the sources. Uh, breaking news from, from other media, for me, it's very important also because um, Sometimes uh, environmental issues are given small spots and uh, just uh, it's a description of, of a certain issue. So uh, this can give us like a hint to investigate and we can have a whole new investigation just from uh, a little fact. Uh, collaborative journalism nowadays, I think it's very, very important uh, because we have to see other journalists uh, that are doing this, uh, that are writing about these issues as allies and not as competition, uh, because we can investigate a lot more. Uh, local laws, I think it's very important to um, find or uh, pay attention to local laws, new local laws, uh, also taxes, because many times they have to do with environmental issues. Uh, an example from other countries, uh, we can find what, we can research what is happening in other countries, so we can apply it to our own, especially uh, what is happening in the region because we have very similar problems. And uh, pay attention to international environmental events. Um, we had this year the, the COP15 that I went and it was very important because, um, it was very important because uh, there was the global biodiversity framework. So uh, every country uh, set goals to protect their biodiversity and their ecosystem. So it's very important to look uh, what are the compromises and goals from your country. And also I suggest to look at the, at the papers, uh, the things that were agreed on these events, and also to look at the first drafts so you can see uh, how the discussion evolved. And this can give you also hints of uh, issues to investigate. Uh, you can see uh, mainly which were the aspects in brackets, uh, that are the ones that cause more discussion. So you can see if your country uh, accepted that or support that idea. Uh, I think it's very important as well as climate change uh, COP, CITES to know about a species and always uh, all of these issues has, have interests behind. So it's very important as a teacher told me in a, in a webinar to follow the money. Always pay attention to uh, where resources are going um, in which uh, issues uh, your authorities, environmental authorities are spending their money, how much uh, money is uh, getting into the country from donuts or from other countries and in what is being used. I think it's very important to see how much is spent, it's being spent in adaptation goals, uh, how much is being spent in mitigation goals 
because as you know, coastal marine um, ecosystems are very important for adaptation and for mitigation. So it's very important to see what is happening there. Uh, a blue economy, that is something that you're very related to, as Lucy told me. Uh, I put here also a definition, but I, I know you're related to this. Um, it's the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and employment while preserving the health of the ecosystem. So uh, what, we, what Blue Economy shows us is that uh, we can have like, uh, we can protect the environment and don't destroy resources and we can have a good economy. So uh, this, uh, it's not necessary to destroy everything. Uh, to have good economies in countries. So I think this uh, quote uh, reflects, sorry, reflects what Blue Economy says, uh, because it says protecting 80% of endangered marine species habitats will increase fishing catches by more than 8 million metric tons. So in here you can see that protecting biodiversity, it also means uh, protecting uh, people's well-being. So uh, main issues related to Blue Economy, so uh, as we know, only 2.7% of the ocean is highly protected. Um, we don't uh, speak or show much about oceans. Um, mainly we focus on rainforests or Amazon, climate change, but oceans are being left aside. So it's very important uh, to focus on that and to show that everything has an impact in oceans and oceans impact uh, on our lives. So we have issues like ecotourism, clean energies, uh, sustainable fishing, circular economy, how wastes are using as resources, innovation, sustainable initiatives or protected area. There, there are some issues that can relate to blue economy in each of your countries and in the least especially. So uh, an example is uh, tourism. So we know uh, there can be many angles to tell stories about tourism. We know that tourism in countries like uh, the region are, are an alternative for extractivism activities. Uh, I know I, I know if uh, you can correct me later, if not like this. I found a data from 2020 that the list was ranking uh, 129 in the list of countries with no tourism uh, in Ecuador. Uh, tourism is also very important because tourism ranked third on the list of non-oil export ind industries in 2022, and it's the fast and grow fastest growing industry in the country. And also almost 2 million people visit protected areas each year. And I'll, I found some facts that, about this, and uh, I saw that coastal marine areas are the most visited ones, like Parque Nacional Machalilla and Reserva de Producción de Fauna Marina Puntilla Santa Elena. So uh, if we want to do just a description, we can focus only on this data, but I think that the idea is to go deeply always. So uh, tourism is not always good. We have to know that it can have uh, impacts if it's not managed uh, correctly. So uh, what I did last year was I focused on this uh, alert that Parque Nacional Machalilla was the most visited one. So I started to investigate and I found that in here, there's a lack of regulations that coral reefs uh, have are in danger because there's a lot of pressure from tourism. Um, there are no controls and there's been impacts on flora and fauna. So you can also uh, focus that more tourism also um, relates with more waste. So what is happening there? Is this waste being managed or not? Uh, more tourism also involves more tourist boats. So which are the impacts of these tourist boats? And you can see how everything relates uh, because if all these uh, ecosystems are damaged, uh, later on we won't have tourism. So this will affect the economy. And for example, coral reefs are home of many species that are resources to local people. So if later we don't have uh, these coral reefs, we won't have resources and people won't have uh, sources of food. So uh, here are some um, tips for me uh, that, I, that I used uh, beyond that and hard facts. So I think that a great challenge when, when telling environmental stories is to get to a wider audience because uh, many times environmental issues stay just in people that care a lot about the environment or um, academists and investigators. 
So we should always think why I should care about this story. Why do you think the, pe the people that doesn't know about um, these issues should care about this? Um, use that data to tell stories and stories to show data. Uh, it's very important to have both things because mm -hmm. data can show you the problem, but if you don't uh, compare it with something or, or show story, uh, this won't get to the public in general. Uh, for me, it's very, very important to identify powerful characters. Uh, this can be human, animals, plants, or ecosystems. Uh, I prefer to tell not only one story, but many stories inside a big story, because for me, it's very important that uh, the audience has empathy with the characters and with their motivations and their actions and what, why they are doing what, that, what they are doing. Uh, I think it's very important to have a powerful beginning. Uh, I prefer not to start with numbers uh, unless it's a really shocking number, because if not, uh, I think that doesn't get to the public in general. Uh, don't let the story fall down at the end. Uh, that, that can happen also. And for me, uh, uh, approve a, a result that we are doing a good job or that people understand what we are telling them. It's to encourage audience to demand a solution for marine issues, uh, to call to action, to make them involved, or to make them uh, know that it's important to, to act. So here it's uh, uh, a story I made last year with my colleague, uh, Ana Cristina Alvarado. So we applied to the Earth Journalism Network Fellowship and uh, we win this fellowship. So uh, we went to Galapagos to show uh, how Chinese fleets or Asian fleets uh, were leaving their garbage uh, or their waste was uh, reaching to Galapagos Island. Uh, so we found a lot more than what we expected because when we went there, we, we found a lot of waste with Chinese labels and they were in a good shape. So that demonstrated that uh, this garbage didn't came uh, directly from the Asian continent. Uh, around 30% of the waste that reaches Galapagos has uh, Asian labels. So this demonstrates that there's a whole city outside the economic exclusive zone uh, that comes every year in, to fish squids. Uh, so we found uh, also that there's a lack of control by regional um, organizations in charge of controlling this because they don't have records of, uh, of fleets that are throwing garbage or that are not uh, controlling their waste. But we saw that this is not true. Uh, we also find that this is already affecting animals. Uh, there are many species that are trapped in this garbage. There are many species that now use their garbage in their daily lives. Uh, we also find that this is a problem in the island because all this garbage, even though it's cleaned and even though they make beach cleanups, everything it's, stays there. So uh, as I said, we start with a small idea, but we found that uh, this has a lot of, of interests and a lot of consequences. And for us, it was very important to use photos and videos because it was essential to, to tell the story. Uh, so I recommend that you do this, that you try and take pictures and make videos because uh, it's a better way to reach to, to people. Uh, here, I, I put some examples. I will send you the link also of this uh, story to see how we created images in our text so people can understand uh, the magnitude of the problem. So here we say how uh, plastic bags were already entangled in trees or how animals are eating these plastic bags. Or also uh, we show the motivation of scientists to dedicate to study waste in an ecosystem like uh, the Galapagos Island. Here's another example. I um, worked uh, in unregulated shark fishing for uh, Instagram and it was about Loopholes in fuel, uh, how loopholes fuel shark fin trade in Ecuador. Uh, here, it's uh, not allowed to fish uh, sharks uh, intentionally, but it is allowed to fish them uh, incidentally. But uh, as a result, we have 250,000 uh, sharks that are fished each year incidentally. And the problem is that. Uh, laws that don't establish uh, a limit 
so people can uh, keep fishing them incidentally. Uh, so this was a, a powerful story. We had a lot of data, and, but we used also images. Here I put an example of how we started. Uh, we started uh, by telling a story also uh, because uh, this um, started with the breaking, breaking up news that um, the research was going to expand around the Galapagos Island to protect sharks uh, from um, international fleets. But what we show is that we are uh, protecting them from international fleets, but not from national fleets. So when they leave uh, the reserve, they can be fished. So I will leave you the link of this also. Um, here I've put some examples of solution-based environmental journalists uh, that can be applied also in, in countries like yours. Um, this is about how fishermen and community in a coastal region organize themselves with scientists to protect sharks. And they learn techniques uh, to, to take care of the sharks and they promote tourism where tourists can go and swim with sharks and learn how to make a technique to revive them. And, and so sharks start to breathe again. Uh, it's, it's very interesting and they have organized and now they don't allow others to come and fish uh, sharks in here. And this is another example. It's how uh, local communities are protecting mangroves and, and they are promoting tourism here. Uh, this is in a lot of province that it's a province, a province that has lost 70% uh, of their mangroves in 50 years. So it's a, a very chaotic situation and uh, communities have empowered themselves to bring tourists to know their mangroves and to know um, the need to protect them. And also they stay in locals home and they are organizing a whole system of tourism. So I think it's very important to also show uh, positive examples because people like to know these examples and also they, were, they will motivate to act and they can know that uh, their solutions and they can uh, help. Um, basic tips based on what I tell you uh, for collaborative journalism. Um, I don't think it's, there's a recite but uh, I think it's very important to establish responsibilities, um, to divide your investigation, your reporting and writing. That is what we did uh, with Ana Cristina. We always organized our, ourselves. Uh, both of us wrote the, the story, uh, double check, uh, fact check, and always communicate because I think it's very, very important to establish a good communication. And to remember that uh, you're a team and not in a race to win or to have more protagonists. Uh, in the other case, I had problems to get official information. Uh, so I think it's very important to establish a method to get information for, from authorities. Uh, first, always send information requests to have a support. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes in these issues that they answer, especially in my country. Uh, maybe it's the same in yours. Uh, so, Always keep in mind what NGO, NGOs are working with government in uh, each issue. And many times they are the ones that have the data. So you can ask them. Also contact past authorities, past ministers, um, or as what they call the widows of power that were former employees that worked there. And they will they have information and they, they can guide you. I think it's important in some issues to have also lawyers advice. Uh, to know about the technical issues uh, and also protect your information. Uh, here I put some environmental investigations that I can think uh, can be helpful in various issues like as emissions, invasive species, underwater mining. Um, here are some of which I talked before, so you can check them. And also when you don't have official information, I think you can use useful websites and tools. Like for example, Abrams in here, I could uh, find out that Ecuador was one of the three main exporters in the world of shark fins. Uh, you have Global Fishing Watch, uh, Marine Traffic, where you can find information about uh, fleets and boats, uh, Resource Watch, when, where you can find uh, the state of resources in the world. Um, I also put Bellingcat that it can give you information. Uh, I think this one is very, very useful. It's the Carbon Brief and Routers Global South Database that has uh, information of scientists in each country and shows what is their field of experience. Um, 
I also put here a webinar on climate change investigations from with Gloria Fallares. I attend a webinar with her and it's really, really good. I put also this study that I think it's useful because it shows the connection between uh, that it's uh, between everything like global ocean for the biodiversity, food and climate, everything is connected. And in here I put some tools that can help you show data like uh, data wrapper, flourish map box, and for pictures to edit in a simple way, I put, I put pixel. And thank you very much. Here's my website. Uh, you can send me an email or send me a message in social media. And also here's the website of uh, the media I am, I am writing for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Isabel, for your presentation. I can take from it that we don't have to to leave the ocean behind. When we we have to take it into account when writing environmental stories, and also that we have to pay attention to money because when we write stories about economic topics angles, we are going to get more attention from the audience. Okay, before giving the word to our next speaker, Victor Rodriguez from Mexico, I want to tell you a little about him. And Victor was graduated from ITESO with a degree in international relations and has worked for, 20, for 10 years as a freelance journalist for media such as Playboy Mexico, Vice Latin America, Open Gourmet de Mexico, Excelsior, Son Playas, Ocean Room, Hakai Magazine, among other print and digital media. He has been investigating the marine mammal called Vaquita in the Upper Gulf of California and co-director the short documentary Sea Trip, Odyssey to Save the Vaquita, which won the award for best short film at the Ensenada Film Festival. As an environmental journalist, Victor believes it is crucial to have access to reliable information to understand our environment the challenges it faces and possible solutions because to the extent we are able to produce well-produced journalistic stories, the community will be able to make better decisions. I also want to tell you that this webinar is being recorded so you will be able to rewatch or catch any part you miss on, on our website in the next few days. And attendees will receive an email to watch it. So now please, the floor is yours, Victor. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, well, hello, everyone. It's a real privilege to be here virtually in Belize. Uh, I, I uh, read about your country and it seems like a wonderful place. Hope one day I'll go there and make uh, some journalism. Well, I'm, my name is Victor Rodriguez. I uh, am Mexican. I live in the north of Mexico in Baja California. Uh, my land is also very related to the ocean. Uh, we have a coastal part in the Pacific and we got the Gulf of California, which is uh, by words of Jacques Cousteau, uh, the French uh, uh, filmmaker, uh, it's the aquarium of the world. So uh, I've been involved in um, journalism for almost all my professional life but I really started uh, uh, to work on environmental issues. Once I read about the vaquita, which is a porpoise uh, endemic to the upper Gulf of Mexico and it's uh, um, near extension. So when I started uh, working on this case, I realized uh, all the connections they have with fishing communities, and illegal uh, cartels and well it became a long 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 work uh, and all those uh, um, aspects uh, that i found on my work uh, eventually are it's it becomes a, a real um, uh, we need to find a way how to tell stories about the environment so that people can engage with them and uh, with that, hopefully they all take uh, decisions on their day-to-day day -day life, or maybe it uh, makes some pressure on the decision makers. So I'm gonna present to you about my work. Just let me share. Okay. 
here. All right. So, um, so yeah, uh, marine and coastal stories are not that easy. You know, like uh, we got so many elements that live uh, and that uh, relate between themselves that we need to be, and it's so short, you know, the stories that we write, or if you are a radio journalist or TV or YouTube journalist, we got so, so little time to make a good story that is important for us to connect the dots and, and make a story that it's engaging to the public, but it also have all the data that is needed for people to really understand the complexity of, of the situation. So I'm gonna tell you about a story that I actually was granted by Earth Journalism Network to do this in San Quintin. San Quintin is on the Pacific side of Baja California. Uh, you'll see here right now, it's a beach full of rocks. And you see people that are with bags and they're grabbing the rocks and putting them inside these bags. Because these rocks, which is um, like river rocks or round, round rocks, are usually used for decoration, you know, for uh, exterior gardens and uh, in commercial sites. So, and this is a very not it's, the community is like uh, forty-five minutes from this place, so it's not very easy to get in here. So all these people are gathering these rocks without permission. And on the back, you'll see a small hill, which is uh, the Punta Maso uh, Natural Reserve. So the natural reserve is actually some meters from this beach. The beach is not included inside the natural reserve. And I needed to write about how land protection of this uh, natural reserve on San Quintin was very important and was actually the difference between it being untouched, even though it was used and visited by people, and what could happen if it didn't have this natural protection. But it was difficult for me to write a story about land because land doesn't talk to us that easy, you know? I, I have this idea that uh, there's always a way to tell a story about nature because nature communicates in a different way, but there's no humans that, that are really living there. So it's difficult. It was difficult for me to, 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 to find the path to write the story. So when I realized that this was happening, then I actually have the story or at least how to start the story because I already had all the experts to tell me about why was it important to protect the natural reserve and the, and the coast uh, ecosystems that were there, because on the left side, you'll see some dunes and these dunes are very important for the ecosystem. But this story was the perfect scenario to tell what happens when there's no regulation and what happens when people have no economic opportunities and have to do these kind of activities to have some income? So then the story start to get, starts to get in the complexity that is common in coastal stories. So I started writing about this event and just talking with people or like why we didn't doing this and to the police with have the police, the local police didn't have access or couldn't do anything because this is a federal land uh, and, and couldn't do nothing. But the, the ones who could do something uh, were like four or five hours away, the offices, like the environmental offices. So then you just start like getting these positions and these uh, actors that help you to write something that people can relate to. Of course, it's important that, first of all, you have all the safety measures, you know, like, I don't know I, if Belize is uh, the same in Mexico, but in Mexico, well, uh, if you've heard, it's, 
cartels and, and delinquency are very, very powerful. So it's always important to get in touch with uh, some safe uh, people, safe contacts inside the community for you to not get endangered. You know? it's, it's important uh, that your safety is first but once you get the access and you got uh, this perspective of uh, being respectful with people, it was normal people, families that were doing this, even though, even though it was illegal. So I didn't take any picture of them, like in front of them, but I just was talking with them. So I, I, could, get, uh, I could grab something about what was happening in here. Now, this is another picture of the same place and how it looked now with our rocks, you know? And you got the same hill back there, which is the same reserve that I was writing about. So now without the rocks, on the left is also the, the, the reserve. So now that we don't have the rocks, which may seem like it could not be so hurtful, now the waves with the, with the climate change and the increase of the, of the levels of the ocean, waves could jump the, the dunes on the left and they could touch a very important ecosystem that could damage one of the important economies for this community, which is oyster farm. So then I could, the story was perfect to open my story because people could relate it. And I have the pictures to show what happens when you got no regulation, when you don't have land regulation and, where, and when there's no vigilance on the place. So that's like, that's the, 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 the what happens, no? the conclusion of, of not having uh, government participation. So with this story, with this part, that's when I started to uh, write my story. So eventually the thing is, you get to find what is the story you want to tell? Why is it important? Is it something that is close to your community? Is it something that is affecting the fishing community? Is it something that is uh, uh, on an island and there's uh, some animals or plants that live there that uh, is like endemic to this place? Like why is your story important? Like you gotta, really got inside that if, if it's about an animal that it's uh, going to extinction so then you got a story and then you got to find like who are going to explain this problem now normally like isabel I, I like to work with the community i like to walk with the people i like to uh, be with them to let them meet, explain this the, the problematic because normally and then and and it happens when I work with farmers about climate change. You know, I can talk with experts, and it's important to have your expert voices. So, and to do your previous research, so you can really understand like the terms of what's happening. But people on land normally understand just the same, or even more than scientists. But their explanation maybe is not that complex but in their simplicity, they normally tell you almost the same things. That I've noticed with the Makita. When you talk about fishing, fishing experts have a lot of data and this data is important to, to know it and understand it. But even fishing experts normally rely on fishermen because fishermen are the ones who are always on the sea and they um, understand the ocean and, are, and, and have these necessities living day by day. So try to get near them and to write a story like very warm or very human about the people because to understand their reality is what makes people to wanna know more about the story. So uh, it's about connecting the dots. That's always what I'm saying, you know, like you gotta, you got to find uh, the situations, the scenarios, the people, and start connecting the dots. Um, also, I try to give plants and animals some voice. Uh, as I was saying in the beginning of my presentation, I believe 
that understanding their um, their their behavior, their their cycles uh, could explains a lot about the ecosystem. So once you understand the cycles and the behavior of, of uh, flora and fauna, then you can tell also a, a very interesting story that not many people know. We gotta we gotta be open to the idea that not many people have the opportunity like us to be in many places and to know many realities. But uh, like uh, in this case or the Baquita, these cases were very close to big cities and uh, people with studies and uh, didn't really understand the problematic. So you gotta bring uh, this stuff and put it in a simple way, no? And well, and as I was saying, but also you gotta uh, gotta do your research. You gotta get your sources. Uh, got go with scientists. And go with there's a lot of um, papers uh, from universities that have important data. And once you get to read, well, it happens a lot with the scientists that. Uh, you get as your sources is that normally uh, these papers are so difficult that when you you knock on their on their uh, on their door and just ask questions about their work, they're always very eager to share their information because normally not many people look for them for advice. No, and so so it's it's important to get this relationship with with scientists, with experts from NGOs in, in Belize that are working with the communities. So you understand the terms, no? And, 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 and maybe uh, uh, it's sometimes difficult for normal, for citizens, like day-to-day -day citizens to understand, understand these terms, but it's important for you to understand it because uh, it, it, data is, is what will make your work uh, more uh, impact, will have more impact once it gets published. And uh, so that is important, but how to share your data is crucial. So how to tell the story with data, it's, it's how is it's the real uh, challenge. And having all these stories uh, will help you to connect the dots to share the data. So this, this place, uh, this ecosystem, that's, that hill is a hill that I was showing you in the first picture. So this is what is on the lap of the dunes from the first pictures. So now you see what's going to be affected because, and this is on a protected area. So it looks like a desertic place on the back because it's part of the ecosystem, but the plants that are living here are so endemic and so special that I could tell some special stories about them, describing the rats, that live only in here or describing the plants that live only in here. And for me, writing about plants and writing about animals and describing their behavior and describing their characteristics and why they're adapted to this particular place makes people to feel the place. Because I understand that not many people will have the opportunity to go to this land. So it's my responsibility to be as descriptive as possible for people to understand. And like a chronic, it makes people to travel with us. I think that's our job, you know, to bring them their spirit and put them in this place, in your place, in Belize, in the, in, in, in the islands, in the ocean, and really live what you are living. You know? And that's what I say. So you got to search for men and women that like to talk. No? Follow them a full day. Let them be your ally. And describe a normal day. You know, like is not when you talk on when you got the data, which is gonna be part of your article, but you don't put the information of what is the normal day to day experience of people in there, then people just don't connect with the articles. We need to smell what they smell. We need to touch what they touch. 
And we need to well, put it like, we need to taste the problem that they have. We need to feel like it was their, our family living the trouble. And that's why I like to talk with more normal people. Like in this article, even though I did have uh, the, the words from the expert, which are of course part of the article, the, the voices that I really related to was of the, uh, of the keeper, the Guarda Parques, the, you know, the, the vigilant guy. Because I thought that the vigilant guy had much more to tell me and how to relate to the, the reality of the park than the expert who was in the office. So it's not about who is better, of course, but I give more power on my story to the vigilant because I found that that story could relate, could connect more with people. So that's what I say, like, talk to women, you know, talk, women are always with eyes open. They work with the community, um, talk with children, you know, children have their own perspective about reality. And uh, it's not sometimes more, even though it could be naive, it's also can uh, give uh, uh, inter interesting perspectives that help us to understand like their, their beliefs or their uh, hopes, no? And talk to elders also, you know, like to understand certain cultural aspects uh, could be better said by an elder, you know, like an old woman or an old uh, uh, fisherman uh, who talks about their story with the ocean and their relationship and then it, 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 it makes people like understand like the core values of a community, you know? And, and also it helps us to understand when these values are lost because of maybe uh, exploitation, capitalism, you know, like many, many things that are around us, but uh, their perspectives can help us a lot to understand how communities relate or did relate to nature and, and to put the, the real thing about or the present and how it's been so different, no? So business people, how, you know, how to talk about money, but not only about data and the millions that could be lost, you know, how um, when I was talking about the water problem in the center of Mexico, I thought the best data uh, possible was how much it costs to uh, buy a, a tinaco, which is like a, a structure you put on a house, you know, for to put on water because there's not uh, um, easy access to water. So the what the family, what what the businessman was paying every two weeks to get water for his for his business, and how it increased in the years because there was uh, less rain. It helped me to show what the problematic about climate change was now affecting a normal businessman. He had a paper, uh, for, uh, I say the uh, papeleria, you know, that sells uh, for paper and pens and all that. He was, he was a normal businessman, small businessman from a small town. And he was telling me in his numbers how it had increased uh, the cost for his business. And that's how he was leaving. Uh, the problem of climate change. Of course, teachers have a lot to tell and adolescents, which are, uh, it's important to give adolescents uh, voices uh, who are more connected to social media and how uh, they understand the problematic and how they can share information and how they connect and, and to, to the problematic on their, on their, on their places. It's, I think it's, it's very important, of course. Uh, talk to experts and, and be open always to contrast points of view, you know? Like there'll be people who are, I don't know if it's, you got a fishing uh, situation like in many places in Mexico in the coastal of Yucatan, but some people are, all, uh, are more in favor of, of fishing and some are like a more radical of no fishing. So you gotta, like, you gotta have 
as 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 much points of uh, of view as possible, uh, so you can better uh, understand the complexity and tell better stories. No, so for me, matter many times normal people explain things better than experts. You know, so it's not about not putting the experts, so, but when you are using or citing uh, solutions or problems. You just gotta believe in the people, you know. You gotta believe in on on on, on them because they are who are living the problem. And and I've seen it so many times, you know, like uh, in the Vaquita issue, uh, the 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 perspectives were so different from experts and from people. And and to find a middle point, well, it was a real challenge, and, and it's not easy, but it's always very. Um, uh, challenging and and, and 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 it puts you, you know to try to be a better journalist, you know, which I think you are and you will find your way. So, well, connect the dots, the problem, local voices, extra voices, and the environment, environment point of view. You know, it's 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 about being there and opening your eyes and seeing and understanding nature and its relationship with the community. And once you got that, I think the real challenge is doing a good work that has all this information and you got only like, I had this problem with with, with my San Quintin work and Lucy, like I had like, I don't know, five pages and Lucy told me like, hey, you can't, you can't write that much, you know, you gotta cut it out. So I had, I have to do my, my job before the editor did it. So I had to like, privilege who were the voices who were going to be appearing and what's uh, how to make the story interesting and how to keep the animals uh, and the main part of the story and plants is the main part of the story you know and and try not to be try to put the politics in it but not to be the main well that's my my style it's not the main story that's my stories are the people's stories and with the people's stories I can talk about a little bit about, about politics, and and let's say I I, I leave it uh, in a subliminal way, you know. And well, that's that's my uh, participation. Let me stop sharing. Uh, I really hope uh, you have any doubts. Of course, I'll be open to answer them for you. Thank you, Victor, for your presentation. Great job. Thank you so much. I can take from it that to connect the dots, we need to be good observers, right? To be curious and to pay attention to our surroundings, right? And as you and Isabel said, it is important to talk with the communities, to, to establish a link with them, because from them we are going to to get first-hand information about the topic that we want to to write about so thank you so much and now we are going to move to the q a portion of the event and i have two questions here the first one is for isabel our colleagues wants to know isabel how do you sample that all trash to know was from the asia fleets uh -huh. how did you you could prove that uh -huh. Please. Okay, thank you very much, Lucy. Um, as I said before, it's uh, really important to work with scientists, academists, and, and also local people. So uh, what we found is that um, all this uh, waste that had a Chinese label was in good shape, as I told you. Uh, so this, is, uh, this proves that it can come from the Asian continent directly because it will uh, take uh, many months, even years, and uh, it will be uh, destructed. It will, wouldn't be in the way we found it. We found like they were very uh, in a good shape. And we also found uh, fishing arts uh, from Asian people because uh, th that type of fishing arts are not allowed in Ecuador. And they are related only to uh, this type of fleet. Um, so what we did also uh, was to support our, our information in a scientific model, and for that uh, the scientists helped us 
so there we uh, there was a model where you can see how particles uh, travel around the ocean and you can see uh, you can effectively see that this data didn't came from the Asian continent. Um, also, as we went there, that was very useful because we, we could see it uh, by, with our own eyes <laughs> what was happening there. And also fishermen told us that uh, when um, fleets got near, um, they had more garbage. When they were farther, uh, they had less of this garbage. So uh, with scientists, uh, this was established that around 30% uh, were with uh, Asian labels. Another 30% came from uh, Ecuador, from continental parts of Ecuador. Other 30% uh, from Peru. And another 10% from uh, various origins. So that is what I say that there's a whole city outside because that 30% of the fleets is compared uh, with a whole country like uh, Ecuador and a whole country uh, like uh, Peru. So we saw the magnitude of this problem. And so, so as I said, it's very important always to, to be supported by uh, data and by scientists that can show you that. Thank you, Isabel. Now I'm going to give the word to one of our Belizean colleagues who has a question for you. Hello, everyone. So my name is Marcela Maya from from news. I'm going to start off with a question that's just for my own curiosity. Um, when you had said fishing incidentally for sharks, if you could have explained what was meant by that, as opposed to like the deliberate fishing of sharks. Thank you for your question. Um, this means that uh, fisher, industrial fishing vessels go where to fish in areas uh, where there's a lot of fish uh, of sharks. So what they say is that they don't go to look for sharks. They put there their fishing arts and they capture other fish or they are trying to, to capture other fishes, but uh, incidentally or um, they are not trying to capture these sharks. Okay. Like this, the sharks get in there. Okay, this question perhaps you both could answer it. And I wanted to tie it into what happens off San Pedro, where, as was stated earlier, you didn't, you weren't here listening, but we have a problem when it comes to drugs and uh, drug trafficking out at sea. And then you have a situation where these gangs fight to provide that um, product. But it also impacts fishermen because when they're out at sea, their product is robbed. So they become victims out there oftentimes to this crime. Is that something that also happens um, in your areas? And I know Victor spoke about the danger of this job. Um, but then it's also important to try to cover those angles too. Well, yes, and I can talk about the, the, the reality about the drug uh, related problems and how the communities are affected. It's uh, impacting, it's, it's, it's troubling here in Mexico. And and it's difficult, and you gotta and you gotta understand like what's your topic. If well, if if you're gonna talk about uh, safety problems in your country, then you gotta do some kind of research. If you wanna talk about what's happening to the fishing community that are losing their fishing uh, arts, or that maybe they're being pushed by the cartels to be like uh, deliverers of uh, drugs. Well, that's another story, no? They're loot. But the thing is, of course, that it's a very sensible issue. 
I imagine that it's not going to be easy to get inside that community and that you're going to be easily noticed when you're talking with people. So it happens to me in, 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 in the north of Mexico and, and it, you got to be very careful. You got if you're going to write it, I it's, it's it, I think it is important to be to write about it, but you got to get your own protocols for your own safety, because these people, what they don't want is attention. You know, they don't, they don't want people to be asking questions, to be walking there in the town, just uh, searching about information. They don't know who you are. So you, you got you to gotta get your own protocols. But what I think it's one thing on favor is that you could do some work on distance, you know, like, if you, there's Facebook, like for the, what I, what I made in my case, and maybe it's a recommendation, it's there's Facebook groups of people on small towns, like many times these, these communities on Facebook or WhatsApp or, or any social media platform uh, are created. And maybe you could go in and just start looking at people and maybe first get in touch with uh, a school in the community, so the professor of the adolescents may, may give you some information and maybe he can get you in contact with some family that is fighting against this so you can start writing about it. But still, even, even if you're doing it, like the research on, on, on a distance, still you gotta keep yourself safe with your cell phone number, with your email, with your social media. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy, and, and and it's brave if you want to do it. But please, well, you got your your colleagues and and try to do your protocols of safety. I don't know how how you do it in there, but we got our own protocols. Well, I got my own protocol when I'm doing this kind of research. Uh, keep always in touch with your with families and colleagues about your work, and be always saving your information and and know when to stop no no one's like okay you're you're touching some very sensitive things and if it's not your topic if you're not talking about drug dealers if you don't want to know who is the man or who is the guy or girl or gang who is doing the business then just keep on your story keep on the story of the fishing man and it's going to be it's going to be more powerful when you talk about the fishing community and what they're suffering than just talking about who is the leader of the drug drug lords and all that it's, I think it's a more powerful story. But. Thank you, Victor and Isabel. Because we are over time, I would like you to give us a quick uh, final reflection. Uh, please, we can start with Isabel. Okay, you hear me? Yeah. Okay, well, um, as we have uh, spoken today, I uh, think that there's a lot of interesting issues uh, related to environmental journalism, especially to ocean. Uh, this has be been underreported. So I think it's our duty uh, to start to show all these uh, issues and to go deeper, as we said today. Uh, as Victor said, uh, always take into account uh, children, uh, youth, elders, uh, especially women, because we know that uh, climate cri crisis has uh, more impacts on women. So uh, gender is very related with environment. So we have to take that into account uh, always. Uh, also, when we interview scientists, I think it's also to take, necessary to take into account uh, women and men, because also many times we tend to, to speak only with uh, men scientists. And I think all of us have, have a lot to to uh, give information and, and to contribute. Uh, I think our, our job is really difficult uh, because we have to act like uh, uh, translate, translate information uh, from scientific data uh, to make it easier to people to understand. So I think that that is one of our major uh, responsibilities and we have to do it well. We have to research, we have to get involved to really understand the crisis that we are suffering. Uh, we have to remember that we are journalists, uh, not, on, 
not activists. Uh, so we need to contrast information also and to see what is happening, to go there, to go to the community. And I think this is a beautiful <laughs> job. And I encourage you, you to, uh, to apply to fellowships because there is where I have learned the most. I have met a lot of people uh, that had helped me and that I have found new jobs also that way and uh, new colleagues uh, to make a uh, collaborative journalist. So I encourage you to do that. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to write me. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Now it's your turn, Victor. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, Lucy and all the team and all, all you guys in Belize. It's a real privilege for me and to be with Isabel, with a colleague in Ecuador. Uh, I think there's a lot of stories out there and nobody is writing about it, nobody's telling about them. So just go for them and, and, and uh, do your research, uh, talk with people. And like Isabel said, like uh, try to go for grants. I learned so much and I grew so much professionally uh, with Earth Journalism Network and other grants. Having editors, sometimes we just go and publish and publish because that's our that's what we do like in a daily basis and that's our job and we have small newspapers or we we are uh, we got our, our own blogs and we just are pushing and pushing to go with for more stories small stories but the ones you got a professional editor who is checking your story it pushes you to be better it pushes you to be professionally better and in it it's yeah, and you're inner flame on you to be a, a professional journalist, an international journalist. I really, I really recommend you to to go for 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 these grants. And also, I'm always like to be open for new tools. Like right now on 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 social media, you got this podcast revolution. People are hearing more than reading right now. So maybe right now better way to tell a story and in a creative way is to do some podcasts or you can use YouTube and these tools can help you like finance yourself like there's a lot of possibilities for you to have a, a, a good living and uh, doing some professional work uh, in your place uh, well thank you very much for this invitation my honor thank you so much to both to you all and before leaving this webinar, we, we want to invite you to visit Earth Journalism Network at earthjournalismnetwork.com so you can find Victor's and Isabel's story. And also, thank you for joining us today. And as a reminder, you will receive a link to the webinar recording via email in the next few days. This email, which also includes the speaker presentation and contact information. We will also want to thank you again and have a good day. <laughs> See you.